Right, so welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining uh, this talk on a simple path to financial independence. Um, the idea behind this talk is simply to share my experience and some of the basic knowledge that there is out there on financial independence. Uh, hopefully things that you can take into your life, uh, maybe some inspiration for things you could do yourself um, uh, so that you can also progress towards financial financial independence, building financial security and freedom in your life. Uh, that's the goal of this talk. Uh, before we start, there is a disclaimer, uh, as always. Uh, everything that I share um, is there mostly for education and instruction and um, entertainment purposes. Um, by attending this workshop, you already agree not to sue me for anything that I might have said, right or wrong. Um, and for any gain or losses that you could make based on whatever information is shared during those talks. Um, so yeah, just don't sue me, please. Thanks. <laughs> um, right. So who I am? Why? Why? Why does it make sense? Why am I speaking about this? And why would you listen to a random guy on the internet? Right. Um, so my name is Sebastian Aguilar. Um, I when people ask me what I do, um, I do a bunch of things now. I used to have a different career, but today I'm more of a community builder. Uh, I'm definitely an, an, an DIY index investing enthusiast. Um, I like to call myself a fire practitioner. I don't know if that's a thing, but um, I thought it sounded cool. Um, I'm a coach and an educator, so I do help people on, on their path to financial independence and index investing. Um, I aspire to be an effective altruist. Now, this is something that we'll touch on at some point in the presentation. Um, but basically, I'd like to think that I'm doing something useful and I'd like to look at ways I can do more good, better. Um, I'm a father, so I have a son. And I'm a husband, brother and son. Um, yeah, family is very important to me. I spend a lot of time with them. So in a nutshell, that's who I am today. Um, but uh, it wasn't always like that, right? And the, the whole, my whole story or the whole FI thing for me started <clears throat> um, based on kind of a random idea. Uh, and that idea was to move to the UAE. Uh, that was back in 2010, something like that. Um, and the idea back then <clears throat> um, was that I wanted to work on uh, sustainable projects. And there was uh, a pretty impressive project being developed in Abu Dhabi called Mazdar City. Uh, which was um, advertised as being, you know, 100% green, renewable, sustainable, zero waste, um, uh, zero emission uh, type city. And so, uh, you know, I was a dreamer back then and uh, I was studying sustainable energy and energy management, etc., and climate change. And so I got an internship in a firm that was related to this big project uh, with the hopes that I would jump into the project at some point. Um, so, yeah, that was an internship after having studied and worked uh, already sometime in the UE, uh, I'm sorry, in Belgium. So I moved with a little bit of a, like just a three months contract internship, <laughs> nothing major. Um, and it was shortly after the, the crisis, so that the, the job market wasn't, wasn't very good. It wasn't too bad either. Um, but so I moved to the UAE. And, uh, I had this really <laughs> small job and small pay, uh, and it turned out that uh, life there costs a lot. Um, and very quickly, despite having you know done some back of the envelope calculation, uh, I realized that I was going to be broke. Um, uh, so there was a point <laughs> uh, in 2011 um, where I went to one of my good friends and I said, "Hey, Philippe." Um, look, uh, I'm running out of cash. <laughs> uh, I've, I've, you know, I've, my my contract is finished, and I've landed a, I've landed a, a, a new a new contract with, for my my new my new job, but I don't have cash, and I need a place uh, where I can crash. Uh, and so Philippe, who's <laughs> on this call today, uh, kindly accepted to take me in. You know, we lived uh, we lived we were uh, flatmates for I think a, a month or two. Uh, when I was broke, basically, um, yeah, that was uh, an interesting time for me because I, I had never really depended very much on money, and I never really had any money problem. 
but at that point <clears throat> I, I was negative uh, in 2000 dinam at some point as you will see later um, but uh, I had burned everything that I had earned during my internship I had spent the money that I had during during my jobs in Belgium for my studies so I studied second masters um, because I wanted to do something positive right I went from construction to sustainable energy climate change etc um, but uh, so yeah, I was in that situation in the UAE. I kind of left my family behind. I went on this crazy adventure um, <clears throat> and uh, I didn't have much to show <laughs> to show for it. Uh, and so I was broke um, and uh, that was not a situation I was comfortable with. It was, um, uh, you know, I, I, as I said, I just I had left my family behind and uh, I wanted to prove them that I could, could do things right and that it was not a bad decision to move to the UAE. Um, I, uh, I remember I had to go to my brother. So my younger brother <clears throat> is the person I went to to borrow money um, so that I could uh, pay for some of the things that I was spending on during that time, just, just to live. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, so that was kind of humbling, right? Because I didn't think money was that important. I was there to make, you know, to, to work as an engineer, to have an impact. Um, but then, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a bit tough. But, um, well, the, the good news is every challenge is basically, um, you know, an opportunity to learn. And I think um, that was, from a financial perspective, that was the first challenge for me. Um, I didn't know how to handle money. I thought sort of money was the root of all evil, um, but that was not the case. In this case, money was just uh, what made me uh, feel broke, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, so one thing I did around that time start tracking my expenses um, and so that's what we're gonna see next yeah I started tracking my expenses and um, and I basically took a spreadsheet I had no idea what I was doing and I started putting the numbers there the things that I was earn, what I was earning what I was spending um, and I tried to organize and for a while it made no sense but then slowly and by, by looking at some other examples I kind of built my own little spreadsheet and this is what it looked like. Um, so as you can see here, I got my internship on, in, in February 2011. I was making 5,000 dirham, which is about you know, 1,000 euro maybe back then. Um, and I got an extension with this like promotion, 8,000. So until June, it was kind of okay. Some of this money actually I got lost because I tried to bring it back to Belgium and it was in cash in my pocket and some some random stuff happened, I lost the cash. Anyway, I lost a lot of money there. <laughs> and as you can see uh, on the right, I, I already, maybe that's something I added later, but basically I'm looking at how much, how many months of expenses I have saved up as emergency fund. And back then I was at zero and then even negative 0 0.1, uh, because <laughs> that's when I had to borrow money from my brother uh, to basically survive a bit longer. Um, and uh, yeah, I had no money, right? But basically, why I'm showing this is because this is the very first step that I took to sort of take control of my finances. Um, and it wasn't anything fancy or complicated, right? It was just a monthly financial snap snapshot. Uh, so one line per month, right? February, March, April, et cetera. The salary that comes in, I, I added some fancy columns here, other income, total income, really doesn't make any difference. Just one line salary, one column, sorry. Uh, and then I sort of broke down the expenses by category and I did some estimates of how much I was spending and how it went. So this is more or less what it was, um, like high level rounded, you know, but the idea is just, the key is not to be, like, it's not important to be very detailed here. It's important to just know where things are going broadly so that you can control things a bit better. And that's all I was doing. So you break it down, income, expenses, savings, cumulative savings, right? Uh, and the whole purpose for me was just not to be in the red. <laughs> uh, but thank thankfully, I did land a job that was pretty good. It was a startup. Um, so there was some risk involved again there. So I wanted to be very careful because I could lose my job pretty fast as well. Um, there was there were some very good benefits in being in a startup. Obviously, it gave me um, great learning opportunities. That's, I guess, the, the most important part of this. Um, but I had to be careful, so I, I basically kept tracking uh, my finances just to be on the safe side. And what I did was basically quickly grow my emergency fund, right? As I was broke, I also knew I couldn't spend much because I could go broke again. Uh, so this, this experience of being broke for a while was good because <laughs> it taught me to be 
uh, careful with how I spend my money and, and, and start tracking things um, and make forecasts, etc. And so here's these are all my numbers from uh, roughly the first year and a half in the UAE, um, nine years ago. <laughs> it's a while ago. Um, anyway, that's how I started my journey, really. Um, but then I started saving. I got my emergency fund, um, and that's when something pretty big hit me. <laughs> I don't think it was a complete surprise, right? To one person that definitely told me this was Philippe, right? Uh, and then some of the other Belgian friends I had there uh, is that in the UAE, when you work there, you're not contributing to your pension in Belgium, right? And there's no local pension system. At least back then, there was nothing, um, nothing that you could really that, that you could count on in the future. There's some kind of gratuity system, um, but it's it's really nothing compared to a good pension system provided by the state. So that was not there. Basically, no safety net. Um, and, and no social security. So if you had a major problem and lost your job because of some illness or something, that, that was a massive problem. Whereas in Belgium, I would have been protected over there, not at all. Um, so these were additional challenges. And at the time, they were, I saw them just as problems, right? Uh, but that's what triggered my research in, um, in, in, in many things related to pension planning and social security and how to build an emergency fund and how to how to have enough in case of emergency, what if I lose my job, etc. Um, and and that little spreadsheet basically is um, it was my tool, right? So I would I would put things in there and look at you know how much I have, how much how long can I last if I lose my job? Uh, what if I have a massive emergency, this and that. Um, so this little spreadsheet became a, a bit of a um, yeah, my, my my little toolbox for all, all the all the plan planning and research I was doing. And so, yeah, I did research. I went to my company HR and I asked questions. How can I save for a, fan, for a pension, this and that? And they gave me some information, interesting. I went to the bank, right? The banks are supposed to serve the, the clients. <laughs> um, sorry, I'm nothing, but... Um, and I asked, okay, how can I, you know, save for my pension, et cetera, et cetera. And they gave me really interesting, I mean, a lot of really good information. <clears throat> and I also went to... Uh, financial advisors, for some reason they're called independent financial advisors, but financial advisors. Um, and, and so I got I got information from them and I found, you know, there was there were some things that were really interesting in there. I even considered real estate um, because it seemed to be the thing to do, at least in Belgium, you know, a lot of my friends were saving for buying, for purchasing the first house, etc. Um, but yeah, I thought about this and I, I did some research. And for me, being abroad was already a massive hassle. So I didn't feel confident buying something over there because it was quite, it was it seemed unstable to me. I didn't know for how long I was going to be there. Um, and I was right because I'm, I'm, I'm not there anymore. Um, and, and then investing in something in Belgium from me there was complicated because it required work, right? I had to go and visit places and other neighborhoods and kind of understand the market, understand the things, the, 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 the repairs that are needed, um, finding the right tenants, dealing with the tenants, all of that from abroad seemed complicated or expensive because you have to pay a manager to do most of this. Um, so all in all, <clears throat> seemed complicated. And on top of that, I didn't want to deal with any of this stuff. It seemed like a lot of work. Um, and really, I was already busy with my work, um, which I was trying to keep uh, in, those, in those, those tough times. Um, so anyway, so a scrap real estate, it's not for me. It's, it's still not, it's, it still isn't for me. Um, I think it depends on, you know, it depends from one person to the next, right? But for me, that's just not the thing. Um, but then the information I got from my company HR and the banks and the financial advisors all pointed in the same direction. There were these savings plans that were designed especially for expats that didn't have a pension scheme that they could, cons that they could contribute to, or if it wasn't enough, then they could add those savings plan on top. And there were a lot of them, um, lots of variety, a uh, lot of different features. And then I spoke to, I, th I think I went to, I spoke to at least five financial advisor firms. And so five different financial advisors from different firms, and they were all suggesting those similar plans and all providing information that was quite similar. And so I was trying to find you know, the best, right? If, if I was going to commit to one of these plans, because you have to commit for at least five years, I believe, but most of the time, 10, 15, or up to 25 years. Um, so I had to commit for one of them and um, to one of them. And so I did a lot of research and I, I fin 
in the end, I asked a lot of questions around ethical investment. I, st I had just heard about index investing, so I wanted to see what, what I could do with that. And basically by asking questions like that uh, and being a bit uh, difficult, I started filtering the salespeople from the guys who actually knew what they were doing. And I ended up working with one of the senior directors of one of the biggest firms there. And it was you know, very well qualified. It had university degrees and a bunch of certificates. Um, all of which were regulated and this and that. So it was, it was, you know, it was, um, I was quite confident that this was the right way. <clears throat> and so, and so I did that, right? I signed up for a savings plan uh, based on the advice of a financial advisor. He got the commission because that's how it works, right? Uh, you don't get just free advice, but you're not paying him directly either. So that there's something weird there. Um, so that should have been, you know, that, that should have been the alarm for me, but. Uh, it seemed like that was a thing everybody was doing, right? My colleagues were doing this, my bosses were doing this, um, all the expats in, in the expat groups were talking about these, these financial advisors were even organizing events for those expats, you know? It seemed like that was the thing to do as an expat. So I thought, okay, I'll be, you know, I'll be, um, um, I'm, I'm a grown up man now, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm living abroad and I have to make this work. Um, like I want to prove, <laughs> I want to prove that I, I can handle this both to my parents, to my girlfriends at the time, and my uh, my friends back home. Like, I, it was something that I was important. And I wanted to feel safe, too, because I had nothing and, you know, never know how things could go, right? So I really was looking for this safety. And I think this advisor really gave me this sense of safety, right? He knew what he was talking about. He, he knew that the system was a bit awkward, right? You know, the advisor was getting paid by the funds and the platforms. But he was saying, this is, you know, this is the way, and this is the way that you get advice without having to pay me directly and etc. Et anyway, <clears throat> a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of work there, a lot of headaches, uh, but uh, you know, I kind of, you know, I was, I think I was good for, for a while, I was in a good place. Um, this is from the same spreadsheet, of, like this is maybe a year or two later. Uh, you can see a little bit where my money went over time, right? So uh, just to reassure, this is not my net worth. It didn't go up like that. This is everything I've earned and where it went. So the blue box, the blue stuff is what I spent, right? So this is money I didn't keep. Whatever is, the rest is what I kept. Um, so most of my money, especially at the beginning, was going to expenses, right? You can see up to August, I was saving nothing. Um, it was, uh, yeah, I even went negative. Obviously, it doesn't show in these kind of graphs. But, uh, and it's only from, you know, towards the end of the year, when I start doing, actually getting some savings. I even got an advance payment for rent in the UAE, which I didn't use because I was paying monthly. So I kind of, Trick the system a little bit just to have enough cash buffer in case something went wrong. Um, you can also see where I bought my car here. There's a bit of an uptick in blue stuff, right? That's like a big expense. It's probably my car, uh, or maybe some of the the rent payments I there. I don't know. Anyway, uh, red is cash, right? So I had cash for a while. I started investing with the financial advisor. That's the purple thing, and I also signed up for um, expats pension system from Belgium uh, because there seemed to be some some protection there, and so I started that as well, um, uh, despite not being completely convinced by that either. Uh, and it took me, I mean, the green stuff is basically the good stuff. <laughs> uh, it's, it's kind of, it's a coincidence it's green, um, but, but green is basically when I found out that I could actually invest and actually started moving the money into the index fund on my own. Um, uh, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. Um, so as I said, I was doing research, right? And um, <clears throat> But this, this time I, I didn't just go to the people who were sort of in the space of expat finance and selling things to expats. Um, but I actually went to you know the, the, the basis of this understanding. I took, I took university courses, uh, I read books, I read academic research, I went on a bunch of educational websites, especially financial education. And then there were blogs, right? I discovered blogs back then. Um, 2012, I think I read Mr. Money Mustache and I had a massive aha moment. Um, I'm hoping you all know about Mr. Money Mustache because, well, we're going to talk about that today. That's the whole point, right? <laughs> uh, that one guy set me up on this crazy path to financial independence. Um, the, him and GL, Jim Collins, which we're going to talk about as well later. Um, there were podcasts, but not so much on financial independence. I think there was one or two, and it started really later, 30, 2013 or 14. Um, there was the financial independence podcast from the Mad Scientist which was very one of the first ones. There were a bunch of things about the bogleheads, etc. Anyway, that's when I realized <laughs> that I didn't sign up to a saving plan. 
on the advice of a financial advisor actually got sold the saving plan by a financial advisor right and and for all of you guys who live in the uae or who are expats um this is like this is this is a disease that's you know running throughout the expat world and it's hurting people and i just you know i did all of that research and i did a lot of like I checked with so many people, I did my due diligence, I filtered, I, like I interviewed them, and I still, despite all that, I still just bought one of those things. Um, and it's really horrible. I, I wrote a blog post on this that's posted on Simplify, which is the group that I started in the UE. You, you, can, you can go check it out there. There's an address. But basically, when you start those plans from the start, you're set up for failure. None of this is shown to you up front. It's all written in the fine print. Um, it, they always make it look like you're making money and you're positive, et cetera, et cetera. But basically from the very beginning, they're locking in the charges <clears throat> and you can't escape because those charges just, I, although they make it look like these things are disappearing over time, they simply get um, replaced by some other kind of charge, right? As you see here, the yellow disappears, the green starts anyway, and the, and the purple at the top. Anyway, you lose money from the start in those plans. Um, and so, leaving them as soon as you realize is the best way forward and then learning how to index uh, invest DIY with this index funds is 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 the solution is essentially <clears throat> anyway so if you want more about this you can go check it out there um if all of you guys who are in the UAE um guys and girls uh, please check it out and like, share it with, with your friends and your colleagues um we just heard about the recent story of, of yeah someone losing i think seventy five thousand uh, dollars for me it was just 12 thousand euros but, but some people lost a lot more and it's simply because they haven't heard about this simple understanding of how this works anyway uh whoop, sorry too fast i had made a mistake of twelve thousand euros um and that was so that was costly right because I thought I had done this right. I thought I, you know, I had to control my finances. I had signed up and I got this amazing advisor. Uh, he really knew what he was talking about. He knew everything about finance. Like he was really, he was really, really knowledgeable. Um, it's, it was still a mistake to trust him. And, you know, it's, it's a shame, but back then I didn't know better. Um, so maybe it was a mistake, maybe not really, but it cost me 12,000 euros. I continued searching, as I said, <clears throat> And um, it took me, I think, two years um, to get through whatever, all of that at that time. <clears throat> um, two years to learn how to do DIY investing, right? And, and back then, there wasn't much information on this. Uh, it was mostly, well, it was <laughs> more, more issues. It was mostly US centric. All of the information, mostly Google Heads website was just, that was a, a, a gold mine for me. But it was all US centric. There's there were some people outside of the US doing it, but it was complicated. And were, very few of them were the UAE. Um, so there were a lot of things that were a bit difficult. Very few examples around me. Um, and so I had no idea how to do this. <laughs> um, and so yeah, more struggle. Um, but then finally, you know, just doing the work, researching, talking to people, meeting with people, right? Starting connecting with guys that were sort of on, on the Bogleheads forum, on the Mustachian forum, trying to, you know, everyone who was in the UAE and who was trying to do this, we basically got it, got together and we talked about this. And uh, we basically all came to similar conclusions, right? So to be able to invest in index funds from abroad, so from, so from abroad, from outside of the US, um, the way forward is an online broker, uh, hopefully a, a cheap one, but a good quality one. And then buy and hold, no market timing, low costs, globally diversified, ETFs, um, and I prefer the ethical ETFs if possible. You optimize that for tax for wherever you live. Um, you define uh, uh, an appropriate personal asset allocation uh, and good rebalancing rules. You write all that down on a personal financial plan. That's really important because otherwise you just change plans. If you don't have plan, you change plans. Um, and then you stay the course. That's my t-shirt today. I don't know if you guys can see it. <laughs> Stay the course. Stay the course. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's a very important aspect of, of index investing, especially when you do it on your own. Um, so I've got the t-shirt anyway. Um, by the way, it's a random t-shirt, nothing to do with personal finance. I think it's about some yeah, the stars, big star, and I, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, right, so basically this is what needs to be done um, to invest properly in index funds. 
Uh, as, oh, here we go. Wait, <laughs> this is my first break for questions. Uh, do you guys have any questions on on this part? I mean, I just showed something quickly on uh, on this. Maybe I don't know if you have any questions. We're not going to go through this in details in this presentation because there's other there's other events around this. Um, but if you have any questions on anything that happened in, in the presentation, just uh, yeah, let me know now. And uh, you can turn out your microphones. This is the time. Uh, yeah. And then if I don't hear anything in the next 20 seconds, I'm just going to move for, move forward. Any questions? So I see one question in the chat. I think Florent, I'll just respond to that quickly. Florent is asking how old I was. Um, I got to the UAE, I was 26. Um, so yeah, after finishing my first master's, working in Belgium for, for some time and getting a second master and then I moved. Um, yeah, today I'm 35. Nine so, years ago. Uh, Any other questions? Hello. Hi. Hello, I'm Florin. I'm with uh, my future wife, Raluca. <laughs> oh, wow. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit uh, of a struggle to connect, but we managed. Um, so we have a question about the, your chart. Uh, Raluca was yeah. in the, how did you l lose the money? You didn't know about the, the taxes or what uh, happened? This, this chart? Wait, yeah. this chart? No, this is uh, only to the fees that were charged by the advisor, the platform, the funds, the, the fund managers. It's like all this thing. There were like a bunch of layers of maybe five layers of charges hidden into the paperwork. Uh, and this is something that if you, if you live in Belgium, there's nothing that bad that's going to happen to you. But basically here, there were charges applied from the beginning. Um, and I think on average, it was like 6% a year, uh, whereas in Belgium, that's almost impossible. If you're really unlucky, you might be up to three of three and a half percent a year. But in the UAE, it's common practice um, <laughs> and it hurts the investors. Basically, all the return on investments go to the financial industry. So that's, a, again, the advice, the platform, et cetera. Um, the investor gets almost nothing. And when the market crashes, it's off an investor because, again, all of the parties in the middle, they get their money no matter what happens. Um, Right, so I don't know. Do you live in Belgium? I guess. I mean, yeah, we're, we're in uh, in our loan. Yeah, I'm working. All in right, Luxembourg. all right. Well, do, don't don't worry about this stuff. This is mostly for expats. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully you're not exposed yeah. to any of that stuff, even we if are. you're expat in Luxembourg. Like, we are the expats. We, we moved from Romania like yeah, one yeah. year. And... Right. Okay, but <laughs> hopefully that doesn't exist around here. I haven't heard of any story around this stuff about this stuff here. Most of these plans are. Uh, against the law in the in the in the European Union, um, there you know you can't sell these things here. <laughs> but over there is still the Wild West. So yeah, no, look, don't worry. You have to don't you don't have to worry about this. And uh, basically, all of this was hidden. So I didn't like. Uh, yes, I did miss something, and um, I didn't ask the right questions. But that's mostly because everyone was doing the same thing. Yeah. No, good question. Thanks for that. Any other questions? Okay, then let's move on because I think there might be better times times for uh, more questions later um, based on some other stuff. I was going to say is I had one more obstacle. I had no idea how to actually make a trade. Uh, and back then, like no one was doing this stuff and I had no one to do it with me. I just I just experimented. I took action, right? I really I took action. I tested with a bit of money. And I learned, and it's, it's kind of hard at first, but once you get used to this, then it becomes a superpower because you can learn many things. Uh, so again, you know, this is a, like it's it's a big challenge, right? Not knowing how to start, right? You've read this stuff online, it's like it says, oh, you just buy this, get this one, uh, but then when it actually comes to doing it, uh, uh, it can be daunting, right? Because you're like, okay, uh, where do I click? What do I like? Uh, what happens if I, you know, maybe this is whole thing is a scam and this and that. So it's really tricky at first. Um, but what I want to say is like for all of you guys who are at that stage where uh, you've done the research, you've read the blog post, you've read a bunch of things and like everything says, yeah, you just buy one of these ETFs and just open this account and go for it. And it's, it's, if you're still struggling with that, I understand it's tough. Uh, but, so here's like taking action one step at a time, a small thing, you just text with a bit of money so that you don't lose too much and get used to it and understand how that works and then move forward. Um, I went through that and um, 
yeah, uh, I do remember it was a bit tricky. <laughs> Uh, it's a lot easier if you have a friend or someone who just goes through this with you. So if you can find someone, if that's where you struggled, and you know, just just connect with someone who you've seen you've seen doing this, and just ask them to just walk through through this. It's uh, that's that's the easiest way to just move forward. Um, but then if 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 you can't, if you don't have someone like that, just go with a small amount and test it out. And anyway. um, right. So I had made a mistake of twelve thousand euros, but today I look at this very differently. Right. Uh, I look at this as an investment, right? And it's not only 12,000 euros, it's also two years of research, of work, of struggling, and of learning. Um, so, actually, that's like that's a bit like a master's, no? <laughs> Can I say that I have a, a master's in personal finance? Is that is that a fair, is that a fair claim? Just kidding. I, it's just that it was a very, I mean, it was, it was costly, but you, and I wish, you know, I wish there was just a simple guide or uh something that would help me save this time right but back then that didn't exist um but uh, anyway i don't regret it because today i am where i am and uh and and and, and this is because of the magic that happened right so i started by struggling and honestly that was sort of a gift because from there i could only go up and as i worked on this as i tracked my 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 fine my, my expenses uh, as i started investing on my own uh things just kept getting better right so i had solid foundations where i was saving a lot um my, my job was doing well i was working hard at work i was you know focused on providing value and doing having a positive impact so at work things went well um i i actually tended to go for the toughest clients and toughest projects and i got recognized for that so obviously work uh went well uh, it, it was very tough at times right because um i did have uh, projects where I would have clients calling me at night during the weekend. I would have to work remotely abroad and stay there for weeks sometimes away from, from my girlfriend, who's not my wife. Um, um, like tr travel on, on by plane, work in the taxi, sleep very little. Um, and so they were, they were really, I mean, it was, it was tough, right? So all of this is really hard work. Um, um, but, but it's the way forward, right? So we will see that later, but basically increasing your income is a very important part of all this, right? And we'll, we'll go through that. Uh, but increasing your income is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so that's why I wanna emphasize on the fact that, yes, I took the toughest project, the toughest client, I suffered, right? It was tough, but it, in the end, I think today from, from where I stand, it, it was worth it. Um, I learned how to save, right? Just from the beginning, I kept investing, I stayed the course, and um, I have to say, I probably was lucky the markets were doing better than what I had forecasted, right? Um, so as, as I was doing that, as time was going on and I was updating my little spreadsheet, my FI date, so the, the time at which I would reach financial independence, kept getting closer, right? Um, and that was, like, that was both scary and exciting. Scary because I was in a situation where, like, an incredible situation, right? So just, just to... to, to uh, to give you a bit more of this, the very first time I realized that there was this thing called financial independence, I looked at the math in my spreadsheet and I was like, retirement planning 65, right? And I was like, oh, that's good. You know, it's, I'm sort of on, tra on, on track, although I'm not in bedroom, I have no pension, I should be fine by 65. Um, and a few months later, I do a bit of an update, I look at things and I'm like, 55, I think I could make it at 55, not bad, all right. And I was like pretty positive, I'm feeling, feeling like I had potentially, you know, 10 years of fun extra money. <laughs> and I would update it again, maybe six months later, and it was like 50, and then 45, and then 40. And at, at that point, I was like, okay, <laughs> I need to be very, I mean, um, it was bigger. It was bigger than me. It was, it went faster than I expected. And um, 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 yeah, as I said here, it's scary and exciting. Um, now, this was, um, um, this was, scary and exciting also because i was seeing people going in a very different direction right so i had friends and colleagues who were still with those savings plans who were you know sp spending way more than me despite you know us both being in the same job and doing similar things their cost of living was through the roof uh, sometimes people going into debt um and there was no reason right they were in the same situation some of them single some of them in couples um but yeah, so the, the different choices obviously <laughs> lead to very different results, uh, and their choices uh, tended to lead to 
some uh, some difficult results. Anyway, um, I kind of I, I really struggled because I was sort of alone with this. Uh, it was me and my wife, and I was talking to a couple of people. But th this the savings plan were really hurting a lot of people, and so this is basically what got me to talk about these things. Um, we, you know, as I said, we had meetings with some of our friends. Uh, we were planning on launching a group. Uh, it took it took some time to actually get started, but in the meantime start giving talks to my friends <clears throat> this is the first talk i think i gave uh 2015 so that's five years ago and my slides were horrible um but the message was the same right it's just just good money management will change your life um and so hopefully that's the main message you will get from today's talk um but back then it was the same message just uh, i had no idea how to present this properly i was just using some random pictures <clears throat> but something i want you to see here and <laughs> It's um, it's quite a funny story, but one that I'm quite proud of. Here in the front, oh, by the way, Philip is here. <laughs> Hi, Philip. You're everywhere, man, in my story. That's so cool. Um, so my wife's here, obviously. And then oh, these are all my friends, uh, still very good friends today. And then here, this guy here is my very good friend, John. Uh, some, of the, some of you might know him, because I don't know. I know that some people know him in, in the... In the financial independence belgium group um but basically john attended that talk and two years later he was in the newspaper <laughs> saying i retired at 37 after achieving financial independence in two years so that one talk just just lit something in him right we had a few conversations after this but not very much he basically turned his whole life around right so he looked at his entire financial life he looked at what he had what he didn't have and he just flipped the whole thing around um he obviously is um like he's he's an incredible professional right so at work he was a superstar um, and there were a few things working in his favor but basically he he basically left his, his job after two years and he didn't need to work anymore so him and his wife um it didn't stop him from doing any work right so today he's uh, he's, he's a business entrepreneur is doing a million things he's really busy but he's doing stuff that he loves he's just driven by passion incredible journey um hopefully one day we get to hear from him on one of our one of those talks right because i'd like to i'd like to interview people so hopefully we get to hear from him uh someday he did give some talks for the group back in dubai um but uh, like the reason i'm sharing this with you is because the the only thing that triggered this in him was attending that one talk, right? So I'm hoping, I'm really hoping that maybe one of you in two years will say, guys, I've changed everything and I'm on my way to FI, or maybe I'm already FI. Um, and then I'm hoping that everyone else will get something from this talk that's gonna make them, you know, that was that's gonna give them more freedom. Uh, that's like, I, I wish this to happen to you in a way. Um, maybe not as fast, because you know, getting to FI too fast might not be a very good thing either. Uh, but I hope that you get some benefits as much as John. So anyway, <clears throat> As I said, we were giving talks and we start giving more talks. I got people from the group to present. I got guest speakers and we managed to get massive spaces and we gave talks to hundreds of people. So in this case, I think it was 500 people in this one that we got in the newspaper with my wife. And anyway, the whole thing in the UE was 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 fun. Um, so we grew a massive group there. There's 9,000 people in that room today. Uh, there's not as many meetups anymore. I, I used to be driving that a lot, but there's a lot of good stuff going on in that group. It's called Simply FI, if you're interested. For everyone who's in the UE and doesn't know about this group, you should join that because there's a lot of really good work going on. It's basically everything that I'm gonna be talking today uh, is happening there and people are helping each other. <clears throat> um, right, now to the topic of the day. <laughs> The financial independence formula this is a slide that i've uh, worked on for a while and i was trying to basically summarize how to explain financial independence is just one slide and you see that i sort of get there and then i wasn't happy so i created a second slide but basically this is the financial independence formula right if you have more passive income than you have living expenses then you're financially independent um and i define passive as like as much passive as you want but basically that is your definition my definition of passive is it doesn't take me more than 15 minutes a month right and that's my index investing stuff but for some people passive will be oh i have a business and i only have to check in you know four hours per week like let's say the four hour work week of 
of Tim Ferriss might be their model, and they call that passive income. For some other people, it could be real estate, where they just have to handle massive crises once in a while and big repairs or things like that, and then work on the next deal. And that might be passive for them if they find that enjoyable, right? So you can sort of define this a little bit as you want, but I like to say passive is like massively passive, which is you basically don't have to do anything and you're still making the money. Anyway, <clears throat> um, so that's the basic formula. I don't think there's anything new there for you, um, but if it's new, then um, there's a lot more coming, <laughs> uh, a lot more good stuff coming your way. So how to get there faster is often the question, right? Because the first time you look at this, for most of us, passive income is zero, and if expenses is whatever we spend, what we spend, right? Monthly or annually. Uh, so how to generate more passive income is often the first question. And there's different ways to do that. Um, I like to break it down in two main categories. I think there is one part, which is finding ways to earn more so that you can invest, right? Um, so get a raise or get a better paid job, right? And just keep doing that. Like that's one way of increasing your income and that will then turn into passive income, which we will see in the next, in the next little bit. And another way of doing this is launching a business or a side hustle and basically get either, a, you know, growing the equity in the business or uh, getting uh, additional income from the side house. And the other part of the, the, the this part, this, this 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 way of generating more passive income is to find a good way to invest. And I call this investing wisely or efficiently. I'm not really sure which one's best. Um, but basically, there's two ways that I see can work pretty well. And one is the one I'm using, and the other one is a you know a way I've seen people use. And so passive low cost index investing, um, which is what I talked about earlier, and then smart smart real estate investing. So I would say on, on, on the passive low cost index investing is what we talked about, right? We set up the plan, we invest via broker, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the smart real estate investing, it would be the traditional real estate, but I would say automated and where, where you outsource some of the stuff that you don't want to be dealing with. Um, and maybe even all the way to creating a company that runs on its own and because you're just the owner, but then there's managers doing the work for you. Um, so I would say that that becomes nice, nice passive income. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, but it, uh, this, the, the, that's, that's a real route and there's a lot of people doing it that way as well. Um, now, there are other options, obviously, to generate more passive income, right? <clears throat> uh, but I'm, I'm listing those that I find the most efficient. Um, and often, if there is some kind of additional way, you often will be able to put in one of those categories. So, for example, business aside hustle. Um, so some people generate things like um, online products or things that sell on their own. Well, these are sort of businesses inside hustle. Anyway, um, the other part of the equation is living expenses. So to get there faster, you want to be reducing living expenses. Um, and that is um, that's interesting because often people think, oh, living expenses, all right, so I stop, you know, buying my coffee from this coffee shop every morning when I go to work, or, uh, you know, be careful with my groceries. So, yeah, these are important things, right? But I think what you need to do to really get to financial independence and to, to make a difference is to think about structural changes, right? Um, and, and structural changes in the way you spend means structural changes in your life, potentially, right? Depending on how important this goal is to you compared to the other goals. Um, then you might want to do some of those. So that could include housing, right? Uh, housing tends to be the highest expense on in most people's budget. Um, so moving to a smaller place, moving a little bit further from the city center. Um, house hacking, right? So renting or buying a place and then subletting and letting to people so that they pay for the mortgage or, or the, the rent of the whole thing. There are ways to do this in a very smart very smartly that will make a massive difference in your 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 trajectory to financial independence. Uh, other structural changes, as I said, by right, moving to a different place or that location, right? That could be a big thing. Um, moving to a cheaper place or moving to a place where your earning potential is higher, right? So me moving to the UAE, although was completely uh, unmotivated by by money, it was I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, that was just a very lucky move to really fast track my financial independence. Like it, it made, it made like that plus all the obstacles I had on the way is really what supercharged um, my, my financial journey. And then transport to a certain extent, depending on you know the, the type of options you have. Uh, but if some other ways of doing this, this is just moving next to your job, right? If that's an option, 
And if that really reduces the overall cost, then you get rid of your transport, and potentially go by bike or walking, right? Um, other, uh, other ways of reducing ex living expenses is the mindset change. Um, I think here there's two main categories. There's some people who go, who, who will value minimalism, right? So they like simplicity and that will bring massive changes in the expenses. Um, uh, minimalism is one way, the valuist approach is another way. It's where you basically identify what has most value to you, right? In, in, in the way you spend, in the objects you buy, in the things you do, in, the, in, in what you eat, etc. Uh, but always sort of being conscious of the value of the things that you are spending on versus the value of, say, the future freedom that you could get if you were not uh, if, if, if you were not to spend on those things, right? So the valuist approach, I think it's one of, it's one of the like, because I do spend on certain things that are really important to me, uh, but I, I do get a really good sense of what that means when that money leaves my wallet or my account. I know that this is money that's not going to be working for me because it's not invested, right? And so understanding this trade-off is, is really important. <clears throat> but then it also allows you to work, to, to live really well, right? Because you'll be spending on the things that really matter to you. Um, so that's sort of a high level view of the values approach. Now, these two sides are important, right? So generating more passive income, it's amazing. There's no limit of how much you can earn, right? Um, so if you work really hard, it's, it's, it's a lot of hard work, right? Learn, think and work hard. But if you do all that right, there's really no limit, right? And typically that comes through generating value. So if you know how to do things that help others and if you become very good at that, then that, that, you know, your income will go up. Uh, on the other side, <clears throat> on living expenses, uh, so reducing living expenses basically has a double benefit. It both increases your savings, right? And it reduces your targeted fine number because you're getting used to living on a smaller, um, on a smaller budget. So it does make a massive difference. Um, and yeah, to be able to do that, you need to be able to challenge yourself and become a consumer society. Uh, it's not always easy, but you need to be okay with being a bit different in some cases. Um, that was a big thing for me in the UE, right? I had no car for the, 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 for the most part in the last few years. Um, and I lived quite simply. Uh, and I was probably spending a third of what most of my colleagues were spending, although we were being paid about the same um, and having a very similar life, right? Um, but that makes a massive difference. <clears throat> and I was very happy, right? I'm spending a third, like, I don't know how, like, I, I was I was really fulfilled, right? <laughs> I was really well, I was I was in the right place. I didn't lack anything. I was going on trips very, very often and just, just doing it smartly and like valuing what's important is really the key here. Um, so, my own journey was mostly towards, you know, using this leverage here, right? So working on the career, being as as valuable as possible to the employer and to the client, um, having an impact. That's what was dri driving me there. And then low cost passive index, pa passive investing uh, is is the other tool that I used here. Now you can combine a bunch of these as well, and whatever whatever suits you best. Um, but uh, yeah, these are the ones that I work with a lot. <coughs> So some of you, this is the second slide, right? So as I said, I was trying to summarize financial independence in one slide. And then I came up with this one, which is uh, probably as good. And um, there's less, there's fewer words and more diagram. It's nice. You, you might have seen this on LinkedIn because I shared this last week, um, try, trying to, 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 to raise awareness around this concept. Um, but we're gonna go through that one, one step at a time. Right, so this is where most people are, are. Uh, hopefully, right? So there's a certain work income coming monthly or annually, whatever you, you can look at this monthly or annually. Um, you have a certain level of expenses. Hopefully that's below your work income. If that's the case, you're already in a good place, right? Um, um, some people just, for some people it's difficult. Um, but so if, if that's the case for you, then then that's you're already in a very good place because this is the best place to start. Um, if If, if your expenses are higher than your work income, then that might be good too, because but but only if you're aware of it, right? Because that becomes your challenge. That's that becomes what makes you learn. Um, and as, as as you've seen from my journey, that's that's what can propel you to uh, pretty interesting. Um, it can it can send you on interesting journeys. 
Right, but so the very first step <clears throat> is reducing expenses. And we talked about that earlier, right? There's the structural changes and the mindset changes and uh, both of those combined can make a very big difference. Now, what's interesting about reducing expenses is that this is something that's in your control, right? So all you need to do there to really be able to do that is to take action on the stuff you're already doing, right? And so there's a bit of discipline and sometimes people look at this as um, um, sacrificing some of the things they like, right? But it's really about being smart and valuing what's really important to you, right? And so understanding the value of what you're spending on today compared to what it would be worth in 20, 30, 40 years, and so the freedom that it brings you, right? Um, and examples, so we talked about structural, structural changes, but examples in the size and the cost of accommodation can have a massive impact on the, the years of freedom that you can have, right? So moving from one place that's really expensive, oversized, whatever, to a smaller place that might be simpler, but maybe you know easier to maintain and where you have more time for doing the things you love, sort of cleaning. <laughs> um, that could that could buy you five to ten years of freedom. Right? That could be really moving your financial independence bit by five to ten years. It's that's that's the sort of changes that really makes a difference. Uh, so you need to see what's most important to you, right? The bigger place, which might be more expensive to maintain and to to live in, etc., or more time for you know to be able to do things that are not unrelated to being paid, right? So you don't have to be paid work. Uh, like real freedom to spend time with on the things you really want to do. Anyway, so reducing expenses, um, it's kind of, it's also often um, related to frugalism and so maybe even confused with it, right? But it's not just that, it's it's really, it's a, it's a tool to work on what you value most, right? Uh, so be smart on this um, and uh, that that is such a powerful tool, <laughs> as we said earlier. Um, right, the next step is to save for emergencies, right? Um, you, you obviously we're going to talk about investing, and it doesn't matter which kind of investing you're doing. Uh, you need to have money set aside just for the rainy days in case something goes wrong. In, in case of emergencies, you need to have some cash there so that you don't have to sell any of your investments. Uh, if you are, you know, if you're running your own business, you don't have to shut down your business and lose your investments. Etc. Just save for emergencies. Build build um, uh, an emergency fund is what we call it typically. Um, and, and that will protect you from anything. So that was that's sort of the first layer of protection. It's really important. We often say between three and six months of monthly expenses saved up on on the separate savings account. That's that's like that's pretty solid. Um, I, I say it depends a lot on your personal situation, how stable your income is, um, etc., and what kind of potential big expenses you could have. Um, so it, it's it's very personal. But the general guideline: three to six months of expenses. Um, and then once you have that or you don't really have to wait, but often comes right after. It's look at ways to increase your income. And we talked about this stuff, right? So in, either you focus on your main career or you find ways to generate additional income separately or even launch your own business. And then invest efficiently, right? This is um, this is the part that took me, yeah, two years and 12,000 euros to learn. Um, uh, but once you have it in the control, it's it's a breeze. It's simple, right? You just follow the plan. Just just keep doing what you're doing. Um, and well, this is what I was sharing earlier, right? But basically, everything is in there. You just you do that, and you're set, right? Um, uh, and so once you start investing, that's when the the waiting game starts. It's not really a waiting game, right? You, you you're really working, but you have to be a bit patient because it could take it could take a long time, right? Uh, so you have to accumulate the investments gradually. We call this accumulation phase uh, <laughs> until you reach a certain number, um, which then you can call your FI number, right? It's the annual expenses times a certain number. Um, often people use 25 because they say it's related to focus and rule, which we're going to talk about in a minute. Um, right, so you reach a certain number and if you've done your math correctly, that's a number of years later. There's a little formula here if you want to play around with it. Uh, but we're going to go through that again a bit later. And so that's it. You get to that number. It's invested. Um, and uh, that that portfolio is basically growing at an average rate of 5 to 7% a year. Um, and, and you can withdraw some money every year from that without your portfolio disappearing. Right? And so that money can 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 um, 
can fund your life, right? Uh, and, and you should be able to withdraw sufficiently to cover your expenses. And so that's it. Financial independence is in, in one slide, this is it, right? Obviously, there's a lot of nuances in all of these aspects. There's a lot of things, um, but 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 like to if, if you want to explain financial independence to, to someone who has no idea, uh, I think this is the best the best slide to do that. It's basically saving enough, investing enough so that you can withdraw from that investment without ever running out of, of investment. <laughs> uh, and, and you can withdraw from, from that investment before you reach 65. That's the important aspect. Right, so where, where does this 25 number comes from, right? Um, this is something that's very well known in the financial independence community. Many of you must have heard about this, the 4% rule of thumb, right? Um, and this is based on, for those who don't know, this is based on academic research that's looking at the performance of uh, a simple portfolio, right? With 60% stocks and 40% bonds. This is mostly American uh, stocks and bonds. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it, the research shows that the portfolio uh, of, this, of this type, based on historical data, would last for 30 years at least. And so for, um, depending on what period of time you take, uh, in, in the historical data, that, that portfolio does either good or bad, depending on the stock market fluctuations during that period of time, right? But um, the, the finding that basically triggered this rule of thumb of 4% is that um, all portfolios um, survived a withdrawal rate of 4% or more. So the worst period of 30 years in this massive historical data set um, the, the worst, the worst case was uh, a, a period of 30 years where, by withdrawing 4%, uh, you got your portfolio went to zero. But it did last 30 years, right? Um, so I think there's about a 95% chance that this works. Um, so withdrawing 4% from a portfolio, if you withdraw 4% uh, adjusted for inflation every year, uh, so that you keep the same purchasing power, uh, your portfolio will last. 95% chances that it will last for those 30 years. Now, obviously, this, this is just the basics, right? And from here, a, a lot of other research has been developed uh, that help people be as comfortable or safe as they want. Uh, but you will see that there's different, different. Um, there's, there's a bunch of things that come into play, obviously, in this calculation. So here's um, a bit of a more detailed table. <clears throat> um, this comes from a website that I highly recommend, actually. The previous question as well. So this comes from Michael Kitzes, and he writes at kitzes.com. Uh, a lot of really interesting uh, research on the safe withdrawal rate and retirement planning, etc. So I highly recommend, I highly recommend that that website. <clears throat> Another website that I love is called Early Retirement Now, and um, that guy has looked at uh, the withdrawal strategies for early retirees. And he went into this with a lot of details. He wrote a massive series called the Safe Withdrawal Rate Series, SWR. Um, and so here's one of the tables that he shows, right? We talked about the 4% rule of thumb and basically the previous studies was doing things over a period of 30 years. So you want the portfolio to last 30 years, right? That was, that was the previous study. Um, and so these are sort of the results in terms of percentage chances of the portfolio actually uh, surviving those 30 years, right? So we see that a uh, portfolio with 100% stocks has a 97% chance of surviving. 75% uh, stocks, so it's got 25% bonds in there, uh, actually has a higher chance of survival than 100% stocks um, uh, over those 30 years, so 99%. And then as we add more bonds, then performance goes down a little bit. And so for 50% stocks, it's 95% chances of survival and for 25% stocks is 80% chance of survival, et cetera, all the way to 54 here. Uh, so if you have only bonds, there's only one chance out of two that your portfolio will last 30 years. Uh, so we don't do that. <laughs> um, right, but then <clears throat> uh, he goes further, right? He says, well, I want to look at different uh, other percentages and I want to look at uh, other time periods. Um, and so the 4% rule obviously doesn't do as well uh, for portfolios that need to last longer. So for those of you who want to, um, uh, who are planning to reach financial independence, uh, I don't know, in your 30s or in your 40s, uh, 30 years portfolio won't do, right? Because you, hopefully you're planning to live until much, much, much longer than 70, 80. 
uh, well into your 90s, maybe 100. Uh, and so you want your portfolio to last a long time. And it's good to plan, I think, uh, for a 60 year time frame. <clears throat> um, although there's a lot of uncertainties, uh, still, uh, it, it does make sense to look at that rather than 30 years, because that's not exactly the situation we're in. Um, and then for those who say, well, I'm 35 and my portfolio, my, you know, I'm planning on using my pension at 65, then I only need 30 years. That's not true because that's when you start withdrawing, but you want that portfolio to last for at least another 30 years, right? Let's say 95. So you want that portfolio, if you're 35 today, you want that portfolio to last 60 years, uh, even if you would be withdrawing for only 35, for only 30 years. Um, but hopefully you get to a five before that. And so it becomes even more important anyway. As we see, every time that we increase the duration, the chances of success are going down. <clears throat> um, what most people in the FI community actually look at uh, once they read this, this research from early retirement now uh, is to uh, aim for slightly lower uh, safe withdrawal rates. So either yeah between 3.25 and 3.75. So we see a lot of people talking about 3.5. <clears throat> Uh, because that gives them a higher chance of success, right? Uh, for asset allocations around between 70 and 100 percent, 75 and 100 percent. Um, there's a lot more on the website, early retirement now. I, uh, if, if this is something that is of interest to you because you're planning financial independence soon, I highly recommend you go there and check out the, the safety draw rate series. It's, it's very well written, a lot of research, and uh, I hope you are, I hope you like reading number uh, number stuff. <laughs> so how does this work? So for all of you who are new to this again, um, <clears throat> let's say that you have annual expenses of 40,000 euros um, and you, you plan on covering that expense from the income of your stock market investment, which you invest in Bugglehead style, which is index investing style that I talked about earlier. Um, and so you wanna use a 4% rule. So here's the size of the portfolio that you will need to buy, build, right? So you have 40% is your annual expenses. Uh, you use the 4% rule. So you have to multiply that by 25. And so you need a million euros invested in the stock market using Bogleheads or index investing uh, principles to be able to withdraw 4% a year and be sure that a portfolio will last for three years at least, right? <clears throat> so if that's your level of expenses, you need a million euros. Now, what if you want to <laughs> live a very fancy retirement lifestyle, uh, which is totally your choice, right? Uh, 100,000 euros, then you will need 25 times that, so 2.5 million euros, um, probably luxury life in Switzerland. Uh, and basically, it, it's, it's the same, right? Uh, if we look at a lower cost of living, so say someone who lives on 1,000 euros a year, uh, which is the case for many people, sorry, 1,000 euros a month, which is the case for many people, actually 1,000 euros a year so as well. Um, but for, for some of us, this is something that's as well possible and it only requires 300,000 euros invested. So it's, it's these, these, the, the costs, that your, your expenses do play a massive role in the, the target number that you are setting for yourself. Um, so if you, do, if you do find ways to live cheaply and happily, uh, then that will be very effective. Um, and then I looked quickly at where people could live on a thousand euro a month. And so I went on Nomad List, which is a very interesting website, which shows um, how people, yeah, how much it costs to live in many different places, uh, depending on your profile, right? So here, this is for a single person in one of those cities, living a bit as a, as an expat nomad type thing. And so with a thousand euro a month, uh, you can live in those places, um, uh, which are all pretty amazing places to live in. <laughs> uh, so totally doable. I don't know if Belgium is in there. Um, no, no. Uh, but there are probably places in Belgium where you can live for a thousand euro a month uh, if you set it up well. Um, let's say, for example, if you own your house, right? If you own your home and you have a thousand euro per person, then that might be enough, right? I think in most cases it would be enough. Uh, again, that's for one person. Now you multiply it by two if it's for two people. Um, how long does it take to get there, right? So whether it's a million or 2.5 million or 300,000, uh, we want to know how long it takes. So here I did a little bit of a quick calculation to show you the various timelines, right? So <clears throat> someone um, someone uh, who's aiming to accumulate 
900,000 euros. So aiming for 3,000 per month as you know, um, passive income or 4% withdrawal. And then depending on how much they're saving and investing every month. Um, so here's, here's the first idea of how long it would take, right? So if you do want to live on 3,000 a month in your retirement, spending or saving and investing two, four or 800 might not be enough to accelerate your retirement very much. Uh, but it does, it does some work, right? Um, now, if, if you can live on 2,000 a month, uh, then, then those investments become, you know, they become okay, right? You can get there in 30 years, which is quite still quite. If you can live on 1,000 euro a month, then in, in less than 20 years, investing 800 a month, now you get there. That is starting from zero, right? Most people don't start from zero, um, but I start from zero. And then if you can increase <clears throat> your saving and investment, uh, then obviously the numbers start getting much better, right? So especially when you're spending only a little or that's your required you know, expense that needs to be covered. Um, right, you can, <laughs> in this case, someone starting from zero, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty intense, yeah. And uh, saving and investing 6,400 euros a month, that's, that's I, don't know. I don't know if it's realistic for Belgium, uh, maybe maybe some of the ministers or something. Or you know, if 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 you're if if you're a very high paid senior executive somewhere, right? You could get it, you can get up there very fast, um, and then retire in the place that's decent and cheap, and that could be done very fast. So for most of the people who are earning a lot of money, I think any of this, like really, any of this can be done in in about ten years, right? Ten to fifteen years is doable for most people who are making a good living in Belgium if they're willing to change a bit the lifestyle, generate some savings investing, and then um, uh, reducing their <clears throat> their monthly expenses so that they can cover it fast. Um, right, are there any questions so far? So any questions on what we just covered? If you could turn on your mics and ask hey. the questions. I have here okay. like, Hello, Sebastian. three questions, I think. But yeah, yeah, let's go through that first. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's yeah, me, Omar. Yeah, it's me. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for the presentation. I have just just a, a, a question because as you were saying that the, the plan is, uh, let's say, it's uh, relatively uh, simple. No, we just need to have 25 times yeah. the expenses. And what is what is uh, the reaction, let's say, from some uh, financial uh, advisors when you talk about this subject with them uh, because they, <laughs> I think that they don't necessarily uh, follow this this approach. No, they just uh, uh, follow the most uh, traditional so, way. So, what what do they think? So it, that will depend on the advisor you're speaking to, right? So some advisors are aware of this, right? Um, I think there's more and more of them. Uh, back then, the advisor I was working with in the UAE, I did go through this with him. Right? And I did tell him, look, I'm going to change everything. I'm leaving your plan. And look, here's what I'm doing. Because he told me, like, my problem is I like this guy, right? He was knowledgeable. I'm pretty sure he didn't know he was hurting me. Or, you know, that's that's what he learned to do, right? So the advisor, at least what he was telling me, is that he was investing in the same products as the one that he had sold me. Obviously, he doesn't have to pay all the fees, but his money was in those things, uh, which still had fees from the fund managers and platform, right? Um, and so I did share him, with him my ideas around index investing and look, I only need this much. And so in five years or 10 years or something like that, I'll be done. And, and he was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> but he was still doing this based on his, uh, you know, on his products with massive commissions. Um, so he did understand you know, the index investing approach and he did say yes for, uh, for, for, for investors who are educated, that have educated themselves enough then that's a way forward, right? So he understood. And the day I asked to get my money back from the plan and close it, he asked no question because we had conversations before. Um, um, and so some of them are aware of this stuff. Most of them are just there because it make it's making them a lot of money. And you know, they're they're in they're in the they're in the rat race and they're there to make more money and and they spend a lot and yeah, it's so it will depend. It, it's very depend well, it depends on the advisor. Um, but I would say most will be very supportive of the idea if you approach it the right way. Yeah. But then they will lose some business because of you. But that's, you know, that's just life, right? But they're happy for you typically if they really care. Yeah. Thank you. 
Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Florent. Florent. How is the inflation um, yeah. kept? Yeah. Yeah, no, very good question. So the all the numbers that we looked at are uh, in, including inflation. Well, basically, I think where this comes from, obviously, it's here, right? Let me come back here. Um, this one. Um, here, the, the assumption is that the 4% is adjusted by for inflation every year. So the first year you withdraw 4%, the following year it's 4% plus minus whatever the inflation inflation was. Um, and you keep going, going that for 30 years, right? So inflation is taken into the calculations here. Um, and the way this is done practically is that you withdraw that, that amount the first year, and the following year you just check what was the inflation this year, and boom, you withdraw that. And, you know, you just add the inflation to it. Um, so, so it's pretty simple in, from that perspective. <clears throat> Now, when you look at this data here, right, those those numbers that I did, this is all done in, say, today's dollars, or today's euros, sorry. Uh, so if today, your, if today your expenses are, say, 1,000 or 2,000 euros a month, um, then these, these numbers are correct for today. And so if you're expecting your expenses in retirement to be at this level in say in 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 the value of euros today then this is correct um yes the actual values will be higher right because they need to be adjusted for inflation every year so say the 1000 euro a month uh, in the calculation today you say okay that's fine i can save about a thousand euro every month so i should be able to make it in say 15 years right well in 15 years over time you will be putting uh, increasing your investment uh, you know, gradually the assumption is that everything moves onward with with inflation. So all of this is with inflation. So so the a thousand euro that you invest uh, monthly will be going up with inflation uh, month by month or year after year. And at the end, you will not be withdrawing a thousand euro a month, uh, but whatever that is, uh, that value is plus inflation, uh, say in fifteen years, right? So after applying, say fifteen times, you know, two two. Or, Two or two point five, two or three percent increase every year. Uh, so that could be two thousand euro then, or two thousand five hundred. I don't know exactly. But so yeah, everything, all of this here takes into account inflation, but is all described in today's euros. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes. So uh, maybe the the table should include some percentage because you said about the percentage. Like if you change this, your salary or your income you change the <laughs> you, you retain the percentage of investment but as the as the income goes up the investment goes up um yeah just to make same thing simple here we say everything moves aligned with inflation right so if you here this works for whether inflation is zero percent in the next 50 years one percent or ten percent this this table still works because it's all uh, the assumption is that everything moves with inflation and it still all works very good. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, basically, I should probably just add a line saying this is all, you know, this is all in today's euros. So uh, inflation is uh, taken into account or something. Uh, yeah, I probably should clarify that. Cool. Yes, and asterisk. And... Yes, yes. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, I'm Danny. Bye. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. First of all, I really want to thank you uh, for the time uh, that you spent explaining uh, all the details. I appreciate. Um, sure. Um, my, my quick question is, uh, maybe I missed it. Are you, are you living in Belgium right now or still in UAE? Uh, living? Maybe I missed it. You said it, but I missed that information. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm back in Belgium. Back in Belgium. Okay. Um, the, the second question is um, that I'm 100% I'm okay that the most important issue is that to accumulate more capital, that means increase the revenue and reduce the expenses uh, each month. Um, I mean, you know, it's easier when you go to people like uh, Saudi Arabia or people in, in, in countries in UAE to have like higher revenues than people living yeah, in Belgium. Course. Um, so what, what do you think about that? I mean, about the real, the people that 
living here, you know, have like small revenues, like around 1,500, 2,000 euros, and they have some expenses. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think the best way to increase the revenues and increase the accumulation of capital in order to invest them there? And did you have to think about, I mean, using the leverage, uh, financial leverage from the bank's institution to buy real estate, for, for example, in Belgium? I mean, you, you accumulate, let's yeah, say, yeah. 10 to 15 to 20 percent, and then the other 80 percent, you use them to, to invest in real estate, let's say. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you brought very good points there, right? Um, um, I think there are ways for most Belgians to make a very, very big difference. And yes, it does involve real estate. Um, so, 100% agree with you. Leverage, if it's used in the right way. So, I mean, it, it does depend on the stability of your main income to be able to pay for that mortgage or whatever rent you're gonna get. But even that, in some cases, can be unstable, right? So, with with the current situation with the coronavirus, a lot of people just can't pay rent, right? So what happens to your to investment and your mortgage payment, etc.? So um, yes, but it comes with a certain level of risk that we need to be ready to bear, right? Um, and so it's not for everyone, but it is probably the most powerful way to move forward fast in Belgium. Um, and and I would say the I did mention house hacking, right? And that is probably like. Like that is pro there's there's two things that in my opinion really make a massive difference, right? One is I believe house hacking is you find ways to get tenants to pay for your either your rent or your mortgage, right? And so it, it, it does require work, it does require potentially a large capital up front, right, to get the place, etc. Uh, but if set up properly, that is a massive boost, right? Because you could be saving I don't know half your rent or the whole rent, maybe even make a profit on top, right? Um, and that is, but that is real estate. So that is the stuff, and uh, there's a lot of work. I'm not an expert, but I know it's a lot of work. Uh, but if you're willing to put the work, and that is your best option to actually generate income, that is amazing, right? Just so I would say that is worth spending time and money on to learn and to do it properly. And I don't know how to do that, right? So, <laughs> uh, but but this this is very powerful. Uh, the other one is what you mentioned, right? Finding a way to increase your income in an unconventional way. And I just got lucky, right? The way I got to, to where I got in the UAE, it, it, I wasn't even planning on making money there. It's just, it, it just happened. So it's, but but it is an option that's available for most people. Not everyone, obviously, because we have all, we all have roots, uh, but I would say for young people, right? And maybe people with, with a very young family, it is still a way, especially if, if, if both have some sort of professional uh, qualification that has value abroad, right? And it could be UAE, but it could be some other places. Um, and if, if but so, but all of these, so this requires a sacrifice, right? So from a family perspective, a social circle perspective, um, but one thing that people often get wrong is that yes, expat life can be tough, but once you're there, things can be okay, right? Uh, it's it, expat life is easier than most people think, um, but it does require some sacrifice from a social perspective, um, uh, if, especially if you can't handle say Skype calls and regular video conferencing things. Um, but yeah, I would say these are the two main things, um, and, and, and they're worth exploring if that, these are options for you. Otherwise, yeah, there's a chance that it might take a little longer. We're going to talk about this soon. Uh, we're going to go through this. And there's some other options as well, which I will talk about, especially because despite being in Belgium, there's a massive benefit uh, that is called pension <laughs> and social security, which can help a little bit in this journey. Um, any other questions? I see that we are, it's 5.30. Um, so this is going to take a little longer, I think, than just two hours. Uh, I hope you're all okay with that. There's there's a bunch of slides, um, and then uh, you know I want to be able to answer your questions. So we'll, we'll, um, um, what we could do is like keep putting the questions in the comments, right? We're gonna move forward, and we'll come back to the questions um, like towards the end, so that those who can't last, who can't stay for much longer than six o'clock, uh, you know, they, they get the majority of the content. And then for everyone who has questions, then uh, you get the chance to do that at the end. I hope that's okay. But let's move on. So, but, but please keep keep sending them in private to me, right? Uh, at the very end, I'll make sure I went through all of them. Uh, I, I want to answer your questions everywhere. But what you can do as well is maybe take note of the, the slide number. Not all slides have numbers, but most of them do. Um, so that can help as well. So that when you ask questions, we go back to the slide.
All right, let's move forward. Um, this is something I have prepared for you. <laughs> uh, you should have received an email by now, um, which is called Fire Calculation Tool. Um, and in the email, uh, there's a link to an Excel file. Uh, please, please go do that now. Um, maybe I can answer questions uh, while you do that, but please uh, check your email. I can probably send you the link on the chat as well, right? Um, but we're gonna go and we're gonna play with this little uh, calculation tool. Let me just see if I can share that easily with you. I'm gonna try something and uh, no, this work. But yeah, please just open it. Uh, let me know when it's open. And, and when it's open, we're gonna play a little bit with those numbers. So I don't think you'll be able to make any adjustments, any edits in the file itself. You have to download it. Um, I just I just posted it in the chat. Um, and while you do that, I'm going to the bathroom and I'll be back. <laughs> See you in a second. Okay, so do you all have the Excel file open? Yes. Cool. All right. So it's it's a pretty simple tool, right? As um, I try to make it as user friendly as possible, but uh, yeah, there's still a lot of things to enter. Um, I did set the date as today, where it's basically just this month, right? May 2020. The starting capital is whatever you have. Uh, that you already have invested or whatever amount that you have saved up and that can go into the stock market right not something that you're saving for emergency nor anything that you're saving for um for a down payment on a house or anything like that uh, so this calculator only works for index investing uh, and, um, but then you can also put um, um you know if, if you're considering different options and you have money saved up for real estate investment but then you want to know what it would look like uh, investing in index, index funds and what it means in terms of financial independence, then you can, you know, test the numbers because now you have the tool you can do, you can play with the numbers and check different scenarios. Uh, monthly contribution is how much you expect to be able to save and invest. <clears throat> um, again, it's in today's euro, so it will be automatically increased to follow inflation. Um, then we have the expected long-term returns. Uh, we put 7.5% here. Um, it's it's a decent average return in the long term, especially if we consider an inflation rate of 2.5%. So that's a real return of 5%. Um, it's 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 decent and it's actually quite conservative compared to the real numbers, but it's it's a good place to start. A safe withdrawal rate. Also, we talked about already the last half hour is um, you know how much you're going to be withdrawing every month. Um, 4% is sort of the first place where you start. If you want to be safer, you can go at 3.5, as talked about earlier, even 3.25. Um, if you have other income streams and different things, including, say, a pension, which most of you will have, then you could probably go, go with 4% and maybe increase it to 5. 
Um, that's something that we'll talk at the very in the last part of the, of the presentation. We'll talk about that. But so 4% is an okay place to be. And then the required monthly income. So this is how much cash you need in addition to any other kind of um, income source that you will have when you start working. So if you do have uh, rental real estate, then you know you deduct th those income from whatever monthly income you need. To say if you really live on two thousand, but there's a thousand coming from your estate, then here you put only one thousand, right? Um, right. So this is a, a small tool. Um, I'd love to hear your your thoughts. If anyone has you know put their numbers in there, just you know let me know what that gives you. If you have some crazy <laughs> times with I, or if it's like next year. Like I'd love to hear that. So um, yeah, please turn on your mics and tell me tell me how this is working for you. So Brecht is saying 20 years. Brecht, do you want to turn on your mic and tell us a bit about that? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that's what. That's pretty good. That's what the calculation says. If I, if I need only one uh, thousand uh, euros a month, but I'm, I live a quite a frugal life uh, already, so maybe that's doable. All right, that's pretty good. Like, how old are you? Is this better than say retiring at sixty-seven? Yeah, I'm I'm twenty-nine now, so that's quite okay. All right, all Who right, so twenty-nine plus twenty, that's forty-nine. So that's still eighteen years before everyone else. Mm -hmm. But the, the, right, so you have only half career uh, left ahead of you. Yeah, <laughs> twenty years of staying the course, so it's, it will be hard. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, look. Um, this is, I mean, I don't know what the numbers you put in there, but this is only your first draft, right? So this is what I did at the very beginning and my retirement date was 65, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm saying is um, for most people who are doing this for the first time, it's gonna be a very high number. It'll be like, ah, oh, I'm retiring in 2100 in 80 years or something, right? <laughs> because that's how it starts, right? You start, you just, you have only so much to save every month. And you might have a bit of a higher, you know, uh, expense, um, and there's a bunch of things, right, that play against you. Um, but where I'm going with this is that as you progress, this is going to get better, right? And and that that number week is going to that that date is going to come closer. Um, but look, the fact that it's just 20 right now, it's pretty good, right? Um, and I'm pretty sure that if if you take this seriously, very very quickly, you you know you'll you'll increase your savings. Uh, it might even come naturally, right? If you if you just if if your if your pay increase comes faster than inflation, which is hopefully the case, then that should come as well. Uh, but so it gives you a first idea of where you stand. Um, yeah, what do you think? How does it feel? Is this a big difference compared to what you knew before? Is this new to you, or did you know it? You already knew that. Uh, I never calculated it before, uh, but so yeah, it's it's a, a nice surprise. All right. Well, that's awesome. Anyone else uh, with good surprises or even you know bad surprises? I mean, it's, we need to talk about the tough stuff. The, the tough, the tough stuff is actually maybe even more important. So, uh, does anyone else wants to share? Hello, Sebastian. It's me, Omar. Um, I'm uh, checking the file. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's really uh, good huh? because what I one uh, question that I had before is that this let's say target was like a in a way kind of a fixed number but then what about inflation and all this and what i'm uh, seeing here on the on the file is that mm -hmm. the target is also uh, increasing which is completely uh, reasonable huh? it, it makes complete sense so we see that the, the target is uh, increasing and uh, the the fund value that you have here is also increasing the thing is that yeah. the idea is that that increases faster than the target 
So yeah, <laughs> correct. We, yeah. Well done, uh, file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, thanks for that, Amar. Really, it's, the the reason this works is because I have included inflation here, right? Um, and obviously, it's an expected inflation. We don't know the same way. We don't know the long term returns of the stock market. Uh, but as you can see. In the result part, so even on my slide here, which is not the full full document, but it's just the result stuff, it says future monthly monthly income is 3,165 here, right? Whereas the required monthly income is 2,000. It's because this 3,165 is the, the 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 euros that you will need in 18 years and eight months, assuming a 2.5 percent increase uh, or decrease in purchasing power because of inflation, right? Which is what we've explained earlier. So yes, it, it doesn't take into account that. It does show that. Uh, the, the target FI fund value is 950,000 euros, right? Whereas if you were doing everything in today's euros, you'd be a lot lower. Um, but yeah, again, it's just because of what you said now, we do take uh, inflation into account. But you would see that the time to FI is independent of that, right? So if I had done the same math, but without inflation and everything in today's euros, I would still get to 18 years and eight months. It just wouldn't reflect inflation, but it would still get to the same. Uh, um, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Hi, who's this? <laughs> uh, hi, Sebastian. This is Rohail. Hey, Rohail. Um, well, uh, I had a question about the tool. So I was playing with yeah. the starting capital number and what I noticed was that even if you use a value of $1,000 or euros, whatever, uh, the, the time to FI doesn't change that much, which is interesting because I thought, um, yeah, the, 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 this is something that would be quite important, you know, the amount of starting capital that you, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, begin with. Yeah, it is important, um, but it, it really just is one factor, right? And so 100,000 uh, um, 100, does play a role. But so what's the what's the difference? So let's put it to zero and see what's, what happens. So if we put it to zero, it's 25 years and eight months. So that's still a difference of seven years, right? So this 100,000 do, do, does buy you seven years of freedom. Now, it's not the only one. Obviously, everything else matters too. Uh, yeah, and then if you had already half a million, then you would be much closer, of course. <laughs> so if you put zero, that would be, you know, that would be the traditional numbers that people that that we that we see on blogs, right? Most most things that we see is like, uh, how long does it take if you start from zero? Well, you can put zero here and see what that would be like. Uh, so it would be 25 years if you save a, a thousand and need two thousand. And but then if you have a hundred thousand already, then it's seven years less. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So what's your like what kind of number do you get? Uh me? Yeah, um, if, I mean if you don't mind sharing, you don't have to. No, no, no problem. Uh let me just it's okay you don't i mean yeah. <laughs> if anyone else wants to share please, please please share right what's that yeah i get 22 years 22 22 yeah that's really good yeah yeah 22 years all right well congrats very good okay um very cool Is, does anyone else want to share All right, then let's move forward uh, because it's a quarter to six and I have, uh, wait, what slide number is this? I don't see slide number. 39, I have about 10 slides, so let's do that. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Brech and, and Omar and Rohail and Florin for asking questions, but thanks for sharing. Um, so, you know, despite this being far, and for some of you, this might be like crazy because it might be 60 years, 80 years for whatever reason, simply because there's still all the other work to be done, right? As the increasing in income and the reduction of spending, etc. Um, so that will come with time. But what I want to say is progress is what matters, right? So at, at every step of the way, as you climb this thing, right, uh, there will be more benefits. Like you will feel 
more empowered. They will, you will have more safety, right? As you build your cash buffer, you build your emergency fund, as you build your investment portfolio, you get more safety and, and you get more control over how you spend your money, but also what you do with your time. Uh, there's, you, gain, you gain confidence because all of a sudden you're not dependent as much as you used to be on, on say, your source of income, for example, right? You just become less dependent on, on your, your employer. You gain freedom. You start having the choice, right? You have more options, more opportunities. If you want to take a year break, you can. If you do find that there's a, you know, a, a position that is really interesting in a, in a young startup, uh, if you have the financial um, uh, the financial safety, then you can take those risks and maybe the high paying risks. So as, as you progress, you are you're empowering yourself to do more and to do better and to have more freedom and take more opportunities. Um, if you if, if at some point you realize that you really you have this really brilliant idea and you need to start a business, well with the savings in the bank and in investment, you can you can take time off to explore that, right? Um, so it's not about this final number. It's not only about that. It's every every step on the way every time you make progress every time you invest every time you save to your emergency fund you're you're empowering yourself right um, and it's go this is gonna come gradually but there will be points in your life where you'll be like damn i'm happy like this is good i have the safety i can handle the situation right so the people who say lost their job during this, this crisis well most people said well the market then went down and all this fire stuff it's bullshit because we're losing our we're losing the portfolio is losing 25 percent value like that well, most of these people are the ones who didn't panic, right? Those with the biggest portfolios are like, yeah, well, it's okay. It doesn't matter. I have safety, right? Even if I lose my job, I'll be fine. I'll be saving. Yes, market crashed. Okay, it hurts. I'm fine, right? So you'll be, be you're gonna be building safety um, and, and and freedom as you progress. So that that's why in the title is the simple path to financial independence. It's about building financial safety and freedom in your life. Um, it's not only about getting to the final number. I wanted to share this little tool with you because uh, it sort of gives you some idea of where you stand. But what's important is the, is the journey and, and how you, you grow during the journey. Now, some people will do get will get financial independence, and I wish I wish it to all of you, right? Because it does come with a bunch of things that are pretty incredible. So you start working for money, <laughs> really do what you want, as opposed to having to go to work, right? Every week, you don't have a limit on the number of days off you have and holidays you can wake up when you want <laughs> um most people start by recovering right so after working hard and uh, you know maybe getting close to burnout whatever it is like hopefully not start by recovering taking care of yourself taking taking time off um taking care of your loved ones right uh, for me it was all about being back being back and being with my parents being with my wife and now with my son right so these these are like these are the most important things that happened to me in my life is having that time. Uh, and even if you get to that, you know, when you're 55 or 60, it's still, you know, five, 10 years more than most people. And also five, 10 years younger, right? When you can actually enjoy the time with, with, with people and, 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 and take care of people in yourself. And then you learn, you explore, you travel, you can start something new. You can really focus on what matters, right? Uh, this is for me a massive, like, I think for most people it's a massive driver. Um, and you can be part of something bigger. And um, I don't know if you, if, if, I don't know how much you know about me, but I have another blog <laughs> where I write about the superpower that comes with financial independence. Um, and as, as we said earlier, it, it gives you time freedom, right? And time freedom is a superpower. This is something that most people on the planet do not have. Right. So if you get when when you get to FI, it's not if it's when you get to FI, you will have a superpower in terms of time. Right. All of a sudden you will have reclaimed years, years of time and value of valuable time to use for whatever cause or a good thing that you want to spend it on. You have thinking freedom. Like you don't depend on an employer anymore. You're not stuck with the mentality of say office mentality or whatever it is that is related to money and getting paid. So whether that's via your business or because you're an employee, there's things that you, you say and do that don't always align with your values, but you do because they are in, in your interest from your money perspective, right? And so you are free from that. You don't have, like, how many, uh, I mean, especially nowadays, right? When you say something that's controversial in your firm, you could get fired from one day to the next, right? Especially in high positions. Well, the financial independence gives you complete freedom to you just say what you think is right. 
right? And you can you can think critically. It's it's a massive superpower. Again, it's like brain power that can be used to do really interesting stuff. And you have abilities freedom. Like most most of those people, most of us that get to FI, tend to be you know people who have value in the market. So we we are able to 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 deliver stuff. And that, those abilities, instead of being targeted only at making more money, typically it's good, it's a good sense of value. Um, there, there are things that can be done with those abilities that have a lot of value and aren't necessarily paid, right? So there's a lot of volunteering work that can be done, a lot of charity and philanthropic work that has massive impact, massive value. It just doesn't get paid that well. Uh, but with the abilities of most of the people in the FI community, massive difference. And finally, money freedom, right? Um, and this is an interesting concept because We've worked so hard to make this money, right? You guys are, most of you are probably saving and investing and really being diligent with this. Um, the 4% rule is based on the worst case scenario, right? But the chances of the worst case scenario happening are rather low, right? The chances of your portfolio actually running out is one in a hundred, right? In most of the cases. Um, so that means in, in half of like, the most likely scenario is that your money is gonna grow faster than you can spend it. And so you have money freedom from that perspective. You, you don't, you know, you're not limited and you probably have excess as well as at the same time. So I like to talk about, call, talk about these as the four elements of the five superpower. And I like to ask people to think about what they will do with their five superpower because uh, it can make a massive difference. And uh, anyway, I'm, Impact TV is where I write about F5 for impact, which is how to use financial independence to make the world a better place. Um, so I hope that, you know, you can look at, the things you could be doing with FI or maybe on the way to FI, things that your superpowers will allow you to do that, you know, make things better around you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a, that's my, that's kind of a plug, <laughs> my own blog and my own presentation. Anyway, um, right, so I wanted to list some really good DIY investing resources for those of you who are just getting started on this. Um, the, the number one best place to go is the Bogleheads, and I would recommend everyone start with the investment philosophy of the Bogleheads. Um, uh, like the, the, the next talk that I will be giving will be on this, uh, and the course that I'm going to be talking about is on, also on this, but this is such a good place to start. Um, Jim Collins um, and the stock series on his, web, on his website, excellent read as well. Uh, it will teach you everything you need to know about index investing for most people. Um, <clears throat> And then the Million Revolution, right? And, and they do a lot of really good work in terms of explaining how investing works, especially for DIY investors like us. In terms of books, Bogleheads Guide to Investing, uh, probably one of the first, this first book I've read, uh, Simple Path to Wealth by, by J. Collins, excellent wood as well. Um, for all of you who are not in Belgium and expats, I would say, uh, Million Expat, a brilliant, 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 brilliant book written by Andrew Hannum, good friend. Um, if you wanna, if, if you are on the fence between you know, active investing and passive investing, uh, I do recommend reading a random walk down Wall Street uh, by Burton Malkiel. Excellent book on uh, why it makes sense to invest in index funds and nothing else, and just buy and hold. Um, and John Bogle, uh, he's basically the person who started all this. Uh, and this is one of his most famous books. Uh, highly recommend it. A little book of common sense investing. Then if you want to go more like a bit more deep in, in all aspects related to yeah, planning and asset allocation, then the book by Rick Ferry, all about asset allocation is a great place to, to learn about that. And then there's a couple of podcasts that really focus on index investing, Bobo Heads podcast, which is run by Rick Ferry, by the way, and then the Canadian Couch Potato podcast, excellent place as well. So if you're more of a podcast person, these two are brilliant. <clears throat> um, right, so that's, that's when you want to learn. Uh, from places I've learned from. Um, and then, are there any shortcuts? <laughs> I just put it there because I, I kind of like the idea of there are no shortcuts in investing, but there are smart cuts. Um, uh, it's basically, you have to do the work, right? There's really no choice. You have to learn the right things um, and you have to move forward. And for me, it was 12,000 euros in two years. And then since then, a lot of, a lot of uh, continued learning, right? Um, but so there aren't really shortcuts, but there are ways of doing this a little smarter and so here's where i plug the facebook group so please join us on financial independence belgium um so there's there's, uh, there's the facebook group there's the meetup group um another yeah we have basically we have weekly events on sunday so far uh every two weeks we have a meetup like this one uh, or this one or the one before coronavirus <laughs> and we have also events with external speakers this is where we had 
um, Jim Collins uh, came to talk to us um, in August last year. Um, and he's on my list of guests as well for uh, these online meetups uh, that will come later. Uh, there's, there's quite a few interesting guests before that. Then there's a course, courses. There's, there actually are several courses that are helpful for investors. Um, this is the one I am developing, the Fire Benjamin Index Investing course. Uh, and then you can get coaching either from some, some other investor who is already doing this. As I said, it helps when there's someone who's done it before. That person can help you. That's great. <clears throat> so these are smart cuts. I would say, um, in terms of events, these are the next two, right? So next week we have, uh, on, on the 10th of May, we have the fifth virtual meetup where we talk about this topic here, uh, but it's not a meetup where I talk, it's a meetup where everybody talks. And, and I, actually I'm looking for people who want to share the experience uh, uh, and, and present that to the rest of the group. So if that's you, please let me know. Uh, even if you're only beginning, it's probably the best way to learn is to basically say, here's my plan, what do you think? And then you're gonna get a lot of great feedback. Um, and then the, la the week after that, it will be the first module of the Fire Benjamin course, which is the Beginner's Guide to Index Investing. So if you're new to all this, make sure you sign up for those. Uh, I will send the links. Oh, I think, yeah, I will send the links. Um, do you have any questions? I have one more section. So there's a, there's a question section. Um, maybe I'm just going to go through this. So just keep note of your of your of your present of, of your questions. There's one more section which you will like <laughs> because we are addressing pensions, right? So I'm going to come back to the title: uh, How to account for pensions and other options, especially in pension. So let's take an example: a young couple, early 30s, both working regular jobs, say a teacher and accountant. Uh, one baby for now, and probably want more. Just bought a house, not too big, but a nice house. So, what is their, you know, what is their, what are their options? Um, most people in Belgium will have access to some kind of pension, right? So I put it there. I put it 70. I put it. At, it's start at 67. It might change between now and then. Uh, 67. Just whatever pension age is, we'll have to be flexible around that. It'll probably be later than that for people in their 30s. Um, but so that's so this is some kind of income that will come at some point. Now the actual amount will depend on how much you work, how much you earn, how much is contributed to the plan, to the pension plan. Uh, but it's something that you can determine, right? Um, or you can sort of estimate in advance. Then you have whatever your cost of living is today. And I've added a little bit of increase because you know it's a family with probably more kids coming to pay for school and things and trips and holidays and I don't know. Um, University, there's a bunch of expenses, so there's a good chance it's going to go up over the next 20 years. Um, but luckily, uh, we also expect them, you know, they expect to be able to save a bit more so um, as, as, as they progress in their career. So we have expenses saving over time. <clears throat> and then what they need is to basically build the fire bridge and the fire cushion. So this is, well, this is, I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain very simply how we can plan around the pension, right? So here's an example, right? Let's say around 50, uh, this couple and their and their kids, hopefully then maybe you already at uni at that time, they say, well, you know, with the savings we have here, if we put it in the stock market, index funds, low cost, you know, buy and hold type thing, um, then we should be able to fill in uh, the fire bridge and the fire cushion because we think the pension might not be sufficient. So they have an estimate of their pension and then they build those two uh, those two elements on top so that they can basically retire at 50, right? So the, the calculator that we've looked at earlier um, doesn't include pension. <laughs> so for most of you, even when it says 20, if you can have an idea of what pension is, right? That number will go down already just from that. Um, but then there will be a bit of modeling to do so that you can fit whatever uh, FI uh, plan you have into those two boxes, because essentially you can estimate your pension, right? If, you, if you're in Belgium, you can check mypension.be. If you're in another country, there's normally ways you can have some kind of estimate based on what you've done so far. So if you were to stop today, for example, and not contributing more, or based on whatever you know kind of projection that you will work until 60 something. But normally there's ways for you to estimate that so that you can make better decisions. And then what you do is that, you have you need to have a pot of money to basically build the fire bridge and then a pot of money 
or your fire cushion if you want something on top of your pension. For some people, the pension might be enough, so they need only the fire bridge, right? Um, um, but I would say uh, for most people that are not in the public sector, it's probably worth thinking about the fire cushion as well. <clears throat> and then those two portfolio essentially will be the, your one investment portfolio, but you have you do have those two sort of time horizons there, right? Um, so that's that's one way of looking at it. Um, there are other options, right? So let's say this couple decides <clears throat> to do something. Uh, I don't know. In this case, they don't decide. They just have a lower pension, right? So let's imagine you have a lower pension. Well, you basically need a higher cushion, so you might have to work a little longer. So here, instead of 50, it's 50 something, uh, just so that there is enough in the fire cushion, right? Um, but then it could be someone also that let's say they want a mini retirement at some point. So I call it the mini fire technique. Uh, and instead of going all the way to the fire bridge, they decide to build a little mini mini retirement, a couple couple of years or five years, traveling or working or living somewhere else, enjoying some things. Uh, maybe when their kids are at uni, for example, or some something, right? And then you as you estimate your chance of getting back to work and whatever ex, you know income you can make, and maybe you see what kind of expenses. Hopefully, you can come back and save again. And then whenever you're ready again, you can go into the fire bridge. Um, and then basically you have to contribute to the mini fire and the fire cushion from the beginning. And then when you come back, you build your, your fire bridge and you continue building the fire cushion. And when both of those are ready, boom, you're done, right? Um, another option would be <clears throat> to go with part-time fire. Um, and I, there are some bloggers in Belgian FI bloggers who are considering something like this, uh, mostly because of social security, I believe, uh, to keep social security uh, which I think there is, there are a few things to, 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 to check there, um, whether or not you need to keep contributing. But basically that's an option as well. So if you want to go part-time or say go um, do some kind of seasonal work, right? So if you are an instructor in some kind of sport, whether it's winter sport or summer sport, or you take kids on holidays or you do, you know, camps and things, and that brings you some, some, some income, uh, then maybe there's a point in, in your life where that plus whatever you save for financial independence will be enough, right? And so for most people who have, say, something that, let, let's imagine that they're, um, the option for them was to go all the way to 50, right? And then going to the fire bridge and then into their pension. Well, they could also, you know, um, scale down into part-time fire a little earlier and just be okay with working longer. Or it might be that one of the two of the partners, you know, keeps working and the other one stops earlier. Or, you know, there's, there's a bunch of variations of this. But um, I would say there are lots of options to build these things around what you really value and depending on how much you have in your pension, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's one more, which is basically mine, <laughs> the no pension fire. <laughs> uh, no, I have a tiny pension, I don't even count it. Uh, and so that's my system, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and, and then depending on how much trust you put into the Belgian system or your pension system, and you might or you might not want to go for something like this or for a variation where you say you take a percentage of the pension that is due to you, right? So if you expect a thousand euro, you say, well, I'm going to count money for 500 euros and then build the cushion on top. Um, right. These are different, different, different fire plans. So what's your fire plan? <laughs> No, um, I'm, let me rephrase the question. Do, does any of you plan on doing some kind of mini fire? Because I would say that's the biggest change of this, or part-time fire. Like, do you? Does any of you plan on doing that? Oh, I see. Yes. <laughs> uh, Antonio, you wanna you wanna you wanna share something on this? Uh, we did we did talk about this very briefly, but I don't know if you wanna share with the others. Hi Sebastian, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, very no. good. Oh, great. Because uh, I'm with a clamshell computer. So hi everyone, hi Sebastian, thanks again for the great presentation. A uh, lot of thoughts, yeah. a lot of work. I appreciate it. it's really cool work. Uh, so thanks again. Thanks for the two years and uh, <laughs> the master, yeah, informal no, master you for us. <laughs> um, yeah, that you know, was, um, was one of my plans uh, to do mini fire because I've just done your exercise 
and uh, it's taking me kind of uh, yeah, 15 years, something like that. And 15 years is, oh my gosh, it's super long. <laughs> maybe because yeah. I'm patient, uh, maybe I don't want to wait 12 years to, to, to feel the freedom. Um, so I wanted to play with mini fire, but I was, uh, yeah, but struggling with the impact and the disruption this might have on the longer term. So um, yes, it's disrupting the calculation. So I need you to, to to see what we can do. And the plan is to be mini fire and also to um, during this period of mini fire, it's to launch uh, maybe a startup or business. Uh, you know, yeah. I think we already talked about that before, like uh, impact entrepreneurship. Um, so yeah, that's the plan, but uh, yeah, I have to calculate so, the impact. Yeah, well, I, look, I love that, Antonio, because, you know, FI is really for that, right? It's for you to be able to do what you really is. I mean, it's even better because well, we talked about this before, but you're aligning with this whole FI for impact thing I talked about, right? So if, if you can use this financial freedom and financial security to launch something that is meaningful to you and has a positive impact, this is so beautiful, right? I mean, if that picks up, you never need fire again because you'll be happy doing what you what you love. You'll probably be making money enough that you can take breaks when you want. And I like it. This is you know mini fire moving into business, um, a business that makes sense to you and brings you meaning is probably the very best thing to do <laughs> if you're not in in that position already. Uh, because in the end, we have only one life, right? So we don't want to spend 20 years at the work we don't like. Uh, so that we can quit. Like the whole thing about pursuing FI and the danger of it is that people might be afraid of losing their job that they might not like because they're trying to get to a place where they don't ever have to work again. And this is this is a this is a trap. It's a dangerous trap because you need to be working towards something to find out what you want to try, what you want to do with your life, and 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 then work in that direction. Like work towards something instead of trying to escape something. And I mean, Antonio what you just said is exactly that right and it's the power of fi before fi like this mini fire if, if it leads to something um uh, like that powerful and changes your life and lives of others then man you're beyond fire already right and this is this is awesome uh no thanks for sharing really. yeah 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 beyond fire man this is i love it i love it this is a new hashtag i'm gonna drop some places um yeah anyone else any questions any, uh, any, anyone wants to share a fire plan? Okay, then I'm just gonna wrap up and then we can do more questions, yeah? So there's a question thing, so we're gonna come back to the questions, but we're gonna come back to questions. Ah, uh, oh, there you go, another finger pointing guy. I like this guy. Um, <laughs> So um, for the 23 of you who are still here, and actually everyone got this, I sent an email and it's also here. I would love if you could take, you know, three minutes to fill in this form, um, basically giving me feedback on the talk, um, giving, telling me how awesome it was, but also telling me where it could be made better. Um, I need, you know, frank and honest feedback on the things that can be done better because I want to get better at this and I want to be able to help you better. So if you don't mind uh just open that now i'm gonna i can even send you the link here in the, in the chat if, if you can't you see you probably cannot click on the i'm gonna put it there but, uh, i think i managed uh, again yeah i think it's there so yeah if you the second one i think because the first one has a four in it and the, that's misleading can i can i delete this no. anyway so yeah check the second uh, the second link uh, it'd be great if we, if you could uh, fill that in for me. Um, yeah, please. Um, and it can be done now, or when we have the questions, or after, as you wish. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. Um, we're gonna do a lot of Q and A now. I just wanted uh, to show you again those two upcoming events. Uh, you know, one is a part of the community. The other one is part of the series of talk I'm giving. This is part of the course as uh, the first module. Uh, the modules that follow are paid, but basically this module here will give you already most of the tools that you need to uh, start investing. Uh, these are the, like the four modules. Um, 
and then this is like the full thing, which uh, which is basically the, the breakdown of everything in the course. But uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna send you the links to that as well. If you wanna register, there you go. Got those here, and we've got them in your inbox as well. If if this uh, system of email is working, so yeah, this. <laughs> right, yeah, so. I mean, turn on your mics. You can put the cameras on now. I'm going to stop the recording and we can do more QA.